NL Central buys and sells 2022 baseball environment, waiver wire, pitcher preview, and injuries. Sarah Sanchez joins us next on Beat the Shift. Welcome to another episode of the Beat the Shift podcast. I am your very horse host, Ariel Cohen, and with me as always, Ruben Guy. How are you, Ruben? I'm doing great. How are you doing today besides your horse voice? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm doing good. I got to tell you, maybe it's from uh, all my screaming and cheering. At I've played a lot of softball games in the last uh, last week. My son had Little League. My son did a homer the other week. Unbelievable. Uh, and I had a couple of really good softball games. We won against the best team in the league last night, 10 to 6. We were down 6 nothing, and then we just had about six straight hits, and we scored 10 runs in two innings. And um, I had some really tough jam to pitch out of, but I made some good strikeouts and good pop ups, and just really excited. And uh, I guess I got carried away screaming. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> How about you, Ruby? Well, I did some screaming also, but that's because I'm coaching my son's Little League, and they were down six runs in the last inning, in the bottom of the last inning, and just like the Mets, they actually, they walked it off. My son actually had a leadoff single to start the rally, and it was very interesting watching them win it in the last inning, and it was very reminiscent of the Met game when they scored six runs in the last inning as well. Amazing. Wow. So uh, I guess our kids are off to a good start. All right, well, I'll try, try to talk a little bit less today and let everybody else talk more. And we've got a great guest today. Um, she writes for Bleed Copy Blue. Welcome to the show, Sarah Sanchez. How are you? I am excellent, Ariel. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, uh, very excited to have you once again this year. And uh, uh, you're, this year in Tout Wars, you're in the uh, Mixed Draft 12. Why don't you just give us uh, the Tout Wars update? Yeah, it's my first year in Tout Wars, and it's been a fun season. Uh, So this league, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's an OBP over average league, innings pitched over wins, and then saves and holds instead of saves league, which frankly is right in my wheelhouse. I'm I'm a little bit more of an analyst uh, by trade than a fantasy player, so... Those are those are the categories that I live with more than anything else. It's been a really close league so far. The top half of the league has been kind of jostling back and forth. Um, and, you know, some interesting trades uh, lately. I've gotten a couple of cool deals that I hope work out in my favor. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I am, I am super stoked with the way things are shaping up in that league right now. I think when I looked this morning, I was in fifth, but I was in second like three days ago. So, you know, real back and forth. Yeah, this time of year can go up and back. Well, we've got a great show today, and we'll just jump right into it in our strategy section tonight. uh, We're going to talk about the environment of baseball in 2022 and which player types does it favor, Uh, meaning there are, you know, maybe high batting average guys, steals guys, pitching, uh, strikeout guys. I don't know. We'll we'll talk a little bit about what, uh, compared to what we thought how players should be valued before the season starts, maybe there's a little bit of a change. So we'll talk about that. Let's kick it off, Sarah, with um, high contact, low power types. We're talking about Nick Madrigal, Stephen Kwan, those types, whether they're doing well or not. Uh, How does that compare in terms of their overall value to what we thought? Are they more valuable now than before? I think they are, but it's interesting because I kind of went down this rabbit hole because I'm I'm a Cubs fan, uh, as you might have guessed from the Bleed Cubby Blue moniker and I wanted to know what was going on with Nick Madrigal who has a 16.7 percent strikeout rate which is more than double the highest strikeout rate he's ever had in the majors it's still well below the major league average but he is definitely striking out way more of the time and if you look at his fan graphs page or his stat cast page the thing that jumps out immediately about Nick Madrigal is that he has one of the highest whip rates of his career which is just not something he's ever really done before. And I was trying to figure out because Nick, this environment seems like it's built for Nick Madrigal, right? Like we're talking a lot about Stephen Kwan. Owen Miller has been putting up really good numbers for Cleveland. You've got players like Nico Horner, who I am a huge fan of and think was tremendously underrated during draft season, putting up some really nice numbers without a lot of power, but still hitting for average, getting on base, making a difference for their teams. And I, and I think that this is a type of player that has been systemically undervalued in recent seasons because there were so many home runs and you could get so much value out of them that we kind of lost sight of some of the the contact uh, hit to all field 
types of guys. But Nick Madrigal really hasn't been that guy for you so far. And I wanted to know if it was something systemic that was going on with him or what. It really, uh, I, I have not actually published this piece yet, but it really looks like He's having some issues catching up with fastballs in the zone right now. I imagine that is related to injury stuff. It, it, his rolling 15-game Woba is actually at the lowest point that it has ever been at any point in his major league career. So he's on the IL right now. He'll get some starts in AAA before he comes back. I think that he'll probably rebound just fine. But this does appear to be an environment where if you're a guy who can make a ton of contact, you swing at pitches in the zone, and you're somebody who can hit for average, you can have a lot more impact on your fantasy team than you would have even a couple of years ago. And I'm curious what you guys see as, about that. Ruben, do you agree uh, Stephen Kwan is, has been worth $14 so far in uh, Roto Format 15 team? Uh, Jeff McNeil, uh, one of our Mets, worth $14. Do you see these guys as worth more or, or less than we imagined? I think they're overvalued only because of the fact that if you look around baseball, batting averages are actually slightly up. Last year at this exact time, there were a total of 10 teams that were batting under 220. 10 major league teams batting under 220 for as a team average. This year, there are only six, which means batting average are, batting averages are slowly creeping up, which means that these guys like Madrigal and, and, and Stephen Kwan, these guys... They're not as valuable as they were last year. You can find more of these guys on the waiver wires. I don't. I don't think their value is what they were pre-draft. Um, I don't know if batting averages are up. Uh, I mean, I think they're down. Uh, do you know which team? Uh, everybody know here which team in baseball has the best batting average as a team? I don't off the top of my head. Although the last time I looked a few weeks ago, it was Cleveland, which I thought was super interesting because they are definitely one of my heavy contact hitting teams. And I will say that the average league wide is definitely down. And and this gets into where we're going next on this show. So I'm, I'm interested to hash this out with both of you and talk about it. You know, the league wide average is 234. Uh, that's what MLB players are hitting as of when I pulled the stats a couple hours ago. So it might be plus one or minus one, but right around 234. That is the lowest batting average that the league has had at this point in time, even lower than the year of the pitcher in 1968. So I do think that Rubain is right that there are more guys who are hitting higher in average than we thought they would. But I think that there are fewer overall hitters who are hitting that sort of Mendoza line and the Mendoza line has definitely lowered. So whatever your target was for average, mine for that 12 team Tout Wars um, league, or actually Tout Wars wouldn't have had this because the average it's not an average league, it's an OBP league. But um, mine for my average leagues coming in was right around 269, 271. That is lowered for most fantasy players, and it has to have because there's no way that you can put together a team that is doing that. And a lot of that, in my mind, is the power guys who are hitting well below 200 right now. Yeah. Uh, if you're in a 12-team mixed league, a 260 average, you're probably in first place. In uh, labor right now, 259 is the top team. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, the best team in baseball is the Mets. 256 batting average. <laughs> Arizona Diamondbacks. <laughs> of course, are the, the Mets. Of course. Arizona Diamondbacks are the worst average. Can anybody guess what their team average is? Yes. I, I actually know this. I looked it up, so I'm not going to cheat yet. Sarah, what do you think their average is? I, I'm not going to cheat on this, but I will say that the Cubs are facing the Diamondbacks next. So I did just look at what they are hitting at home. And if I recall correctly, they're hitting 183 at Chase Field right now as a team. Well, they're hitting better on the road. I think their team average is 199 right now. <laughs> One, <Ooh>. 199. <laughs> and uh, and they're over 500, which is the crazy thing about it. They're over 500, and they're hitting as a team under 200. Yeah. Uh, I think that batting average plays up this year. Let's talk about um, uh, low batting average, high power guys. We're talking about uh, Patrick Wisdom, Joey Gallo, those type. Now, Gallo is not doing well this year, but the question is, will that – uh, profile, actually, if if Gallo achieved his projected targets, would that pro profile play up this year or not, Sarah? So here's the interesting thing about Joey Gallo, and I actually had to double check these stats when I ran them earlier because I felt like there was no way this could possibly be right. Joey Gallo has an expected slugging right now, and we can get into why the expected slugging rates are all messed up because of the baseball and the overall offensive environment in a second. But Joey Gallo's expected slugging right now is 572. He is actually slugging 320. That is a bonkers difference. And one of the things that I think is an undertold story this year that you have to be aware of as you're looking at hitters, as you're looking at expected stats, as you're looking at what you expect them to do 
is that these parks that never had a humidor before are seeing some really, really wonky numbers in terms of expected stats for expected batting averages versus what players are actually doing now. Some of that is probably defensive positioning. Some of that is probably any number of things. But a lot of it, in my opinion, is that the physical baseball is playing very differently at 20 of the parks that have never had humidors before. And it's frankly, we don't have enough data, in my opinion, to predict that day to day. So it's interesting to see who this has impacted the most. I actually ran um, some numbers a couple of days ago looking at pull rates because my hunch was that guys who are pulling the ball more are seeing better slugging numbers and better home run numbers generally. It wasn't a perfect correlation, but it did help me isolate a place where there was some level of prediction in terms of whose power was sticky this year and whose was not. And Gallo is is one of the worst in terms of his actual slugging versus his expected slugging at this point in time. It's interesting that you say that um, his his slugging the, uh, the expected slugging is uh, is in general for baseball is down. Um, I, I think because of all the ball effects, you're going to see much lower slugging than the expected numbers because the expected slugging numbers are probably based on a different ball environment, right? Um, but that difference sounds bonkers. I mean, Gallo to me is a by low candidate. Uh, before we go to Ruvain, we've got some trivia from the injury guru. Here it is. Well, we're talking about power, so I did a little deep dive into how many home runs were hit last year compared to this year. First five weeks of the season. Last year, the first five weeks of the season, this is before the whole crackdown on the sticky stuff, there were 1,023 home runs hit, or an average of 34 home runs per team. How many, what is the average this year per team for home runs? What do you think it is? Last year was at 34 per team, and this year it is what? Sarah, what do you think? I'm going to go with 27. I'm going to price this right, you, and go 28. The the answer is twenty eight point six. Nice. Eight hundred and fifty eight home runs. That's that's almost two hundred home runs less this year than last year through five weeks. So you throughout baseball, even if they're hitting for a low average, these power guys are now worth more in leagues because it's harder to find power. Power is down throughout the entire league because of the different, there has to be, it's because of the humidor in stadiums that never had it before. It's because of the different ball. It's because of, you know, the teams are not, it's just not, it's also the cold weather. The cold weather, it it just, this week, it just started to warm up. The cold weather plays in it too. So there's a whole bunch of different factors that play into it. So this may be a time where, you know what, if you're in a trading lead, why don't you trade one of these contact guys like a Quan to get a Gallo type player? Because in that way, you can flip flop and you can work both sides of it. Yeah. I think that the low batting average power guys are actually worth even more than the other type we just mentioned. Um, just as you said, Ruvain, the homers are down. Uh, Joe Gallo is a buy low, obviously. Patrick Wisdom is worth $14. CJ Crone, 11th best player in baseball, $33 player. Pete Alonzo, 7th best player in baseball on a roto sense, $36. And he, the power just absolutely plays. And uh, people don't realize this, but power is not equally distributed over the months. There are less homers in April than there is in June. So there's going to be more homers even to come. The power hitters will finally get there, uh, and they'll be worth even more. Um, Definitely, this is one of the best types of players that I think are undervalued. Do you agree with that, Sarah? I do agree that power is undervalued. I I actually kind of wish I could go back into draft history a little bit because the last few years I've sort of taken home runs for granted, and I imagine a lot of fantasy players did that. The home runs were so ubiquitous, like you knew you were going to get 20 home runs or 30 home runs from a bunch of guys who in this environment just are never going to hit those numbers. I will say I think there is a type of player who is more valuable than the low average high slugging player even in this environment and i think it is just the well-rounded player so i just made a deal for say a suzuki i think he's going to hit right around 270 275 i think he's got 20 to 25 home runs in him and i think he's probably going to steal 10 bags and i think that that type of player who can give you double digit steals double digit home runs and hit for an average that is going to be well over what the league is seeing as a general average is the is the type of player who can make a huge difference for your game 
Yeah, the uniqueness of the uh, spread out category player is that, and of course, ATC projections have that in their cat in their uh, in the risk category. The intra SD is a measure of how spread out the categories are. High intra SD means you're just one category players. Low ones mean you're spread out. Oh, those are very valuable. If you somehow went according to that with ATC this year, you did very very well. Um, talk about stolen base players and. Uh, uh, all right, let's do this. Let's do a little trivia. Uh, I'm gonna. Who are the top nine stolen base players? Let's see if you guys can name it. Let's do Stump the Schwab style. So, uh, <laughs> Sarah, why don't you go first and guess who are one of the top nine players? Ruben, you'll go next. And uh, if you're out, you're out for the category. So go ahead, Sarah. Oh, man. Um, I'm going to start with Varsho. No. Not close, Varsho. yeah. No. No. Varsho right now has only three stolen bases, so that's good for a catcher. No, I mean, it's no. good for a catcher. Hi, <laughs> right, Ruben. Can you clean the category up now? Can I clean the category? Do you want me to name ten people? Okay. Um, Jul- Julio Rodriguez, because right now all his value is in stolen bases. So he, he, I think he's number. I think he's number one, if I remember. Number one, ten stolen bases. Um, he, I have him on a lot of our teams, and we we have him on a lot of our teams. Tommy Edmond has to be up there. Number three, uh, seven stolen bases. Another guy who we picked off the waiver wire in a 10-team league, and that's Jorge Mateo, because I know we had at least seven or eight at the time. It's an Ian Khan special here. Yes, Mateo with nine stolen bases. Um, let, oh, let, let's let Sarah jump back in. Come okay. on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually feeling like you shouldn't let me jump back in because stolen bases is one of the places I'm hurting. I actually am one of the people who drafted Whit Merrifield, and is sitting oh. here trying to figure out why Whit Merrifield has the same number of stolen bases that Kyle Schwarber does, which is frankly one of the saddest things that's ever happened to my fantasy team. Um, Julio Rodriguez, I should have gotten. I knew that. I was looking at that earlier this week, and I was I was a little thrown. Go for the uh, easiest one first, Sarah. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. Um, let me no. Let, let's pass it back to Ruben. Let me think about okay. this for one second. Go ahead. All right. Let me think here. Um, uh, there's a guy who had, a, I think, five stolen bases the first two weeks of the season. I think that was Miles Straw, so he has to be up there. Straw, seven, yep. Um, uh, What about Cedric Mullins? It just misses it. He has five. Oh, okay. And I I, I don't think Trey Turner's on the, in the top ten nah. either. And, and he's Turner not, right? is, uh, yeah. Turner could be uh, turning it on later in the year, but so far he's a bust right now. All right, Sarah, you got anyone now? I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm running, I'm do running I, out do of Do I have here. anyone? Um, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Stolen bases right now. Starling Marte stealing some bases? Wish he was. Uh, uh, yeah, he's, he has four. He's, he has four. He has four. Yeah, but he was also so caught four times. the leaderboard. I'm trying to think who's letting their guys run. The Cardinals are letting their guys run. Yes, name another Cardinal on this list. Um, it's not Dylan Carlson because I've been nope. itching to drop him in a bunch of leagues. Uh, Harrison Bader. Harrison Bader with seven. Um, what about the Royals? Let their guys run, but Whit Merrifield really isn't doing a great job with that at the moment. How's no. Bobby Whit Jr. doing? Bobby Whit just misses with five Ugh. stolen bases. All right, back to Revain. Oh gosh. Um, let's see here. I think one of the Astros, another Astro has to be in it because the Ast- is Miles Straw's running, so I think another Astro is going to be there. Straw's on Cleveland, though. Uh, oh, and, I, I think I know I an know. Astro. It, it, but it makes, you go, but you go first. I think it's Straw, I think Astros. I don't know why I have that in my head. Um, I'm going to say uh, Kyle Tucker because he's a guy for stolen Tucker, bases. Tucker, seven stolen bases. Yep. Just oh, a gosh. few more left. Um, just everyone tied with six. I'll just name them since we're we're doing this in a while. Uh, Machado. Six, Jazz Chisholm, six, Bryce Harper, six, Luis Roberts, six, Colton Wong, six. So uh, there's a top 11. Uh, in terms of, but the point of why I, I did this is that, let me read you off their roto values because of that. Julio Rodriguez, 19, Mateo, 13. Tommy Edmond is a $29 player. Ooh. Tucker, $20 player. Bader, 19. 19 for Bader. Miles Stroh is the $13 player. Manny Machado is the top draw in baseball, a $54 player right now. Jazz Chisholm is a $37 player. And Bryce Harper, no surprise, 37 Jazz Chisholm, of course, was a fade of ours. So uh, that's something that we got wrong. Uh, he's been fantastic this year. But the point is that stolen bases are playing way, way up this year. If you're stealing, even if you... 
I didn't even mention the homers. Right? I just I just read you the stolen base list. You know, some of them have homers. Julio Rodriguez is just one homer, but he's still worth nineteen dollars, right? Jorge Mateo is one homer. He actually, hit two. He hit one today, but um, these numbers include with one. He's still worth thirteen dollars. So just the stolen bases alone are very very valuable. So it it plays way way up. You guys all agree? I definitely agree, particularly since, like I said, the targets I had for stolen bases are kind of killing me at the moment. Yep. And what you really need to do if if you're playing fantasy baseball is look what teams are stealing. The Cardinals are stealing. The Royals are stealing. The White Sox are stealing. Look at which teams are stealing. Those are the players that you need to acquire. Uh, let's go to ace pitchers. Are ace pitchers more valuable right now or less valuable than we thought? Sarah? I actually think they're less valuable right now. And it's one of the reasons I've been trading from some pitching strength. Pitching was the strength of my draft this season. I managed to target some guys who wound up being healthy, who wound up throwing a lot of innings. So I really, I drafted a lot from that um, 10 to 12 spot, both in 12 team and 15 team leagues. I wound up with a lot of Corbin Burns. I wound up with a decent amount of Julio Arias. I wound up with a lot of Clayton Kershaw. I wound up with a lot of Logan Gilbert. Uh, That that has been a winning combination so far, and it's allowed me to trade from some of that strength a bit. But it's worth keeping in mind that the league-wide ERA right now is 3.81. That's incredibly low if you think about it for a year where everybody is using the designated hitter for the first time now. I imagine as the weather heats up a little bit, that will... That, that will get worse. That will not continue to persist. But at, at this moment in time, it's much harder to hit than it is to be a pitcher in MLB. So they're less valuable because uh, hitting is down in general. So uh, pitchers are more fungible in general, right? That's my that's my argument. Yeah, that right now yeah. you can get so you can get six or seven pretty great innings off the waiver wire if you're admittedly you're taking some risk on, but you know. Paul Blackburn has had some outstanding starts this season. He was available on the waiver wire in a lot of competitive 12 and 15 team leagues until last week or two weeks ago. So it, it, there is pitching to be had on the waiver wire in a way that there is not hitting to be had on the waiver wire. Yeah. Um, I will say it this way. Well, first of all, the replacement level, as, as you say, because the waiver wire is better in, in, in general, the replacement level is higher for pitchers. That means that the value of pitchers at the top go down, right? That's just a consequence of that. Uh, let me state it this way why A starting pitchers are not worth as much. Justin Verlander is right now worth $33 in a 15 team league. Carlos Rodon is worth 30 Okay, The next best pitcher right now, season, is uh, Pablo Lopez, worth 28 If I go all the way down to the number 20th spot of Merrill Kelly, how much lower, how many dollars of difference lower is between? Spot number three and spot number 20. Anybody want to guess? I'm going to say like eight or eight, eight to 11, that range. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to agree with that. I was going to say about nine. Yeah. So it's about, it's about $9. So because of that, you really don't have those aces being like $45 players and then, you know, the 15th best pitcher only worth 15. They're all fungible. They're all they're all going there. It's also a consequence of less innings pitched by starters in general, right? But if you if you have everybody pitching eight innings, there's more differentiation. If you have everybody pitching only five, six innings, there's less of a differentiation. So pitching is much much less differentiated. If you were to draft hitter, 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 and then do starting pitchers, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round, getting the Pablo Lopez, Joe Musgrove, Carl down later, Chris Bassett later. You would have been much better off instead of taking that that ace. I mean, Corbin Burns is worth the same rotisserie as Chris Bassett right now, right? You could have picked Bassett over Burns and gotten you a much better hitter. And the top hitters are reliable. Bryce Harper, we mentioned, is a big hitter. Machado, right? The top rounds are worth so much more in hitting, so that pitching is much more fungible. Um, what do you do but with using, that, though? Using using Sarah's logic, though, that that hitting is down right now, wouldn't now be the opportunity to buy low on these starting on these top starting pitchers? Because if you look at the top ten pitchers in WAR right now in baseball, you have Gaussman, Rodon, Musgrove, Cease, Pablo Lopez, Merrill Kelly, you mentioned Tarek Skubal, Max Fried, Kershaw, and Nestor Cortez. Those guys, that's the top 10 war so far in, of the starting pitchers. 
those guys aren't, I mean, how many of those guys are going to make it through the whole season without num- number one, getting hurt, and number two, continuing what they're doing? I mean, you think that the aces that you drafted early on, if they're not doing what they what you want them to do now, why don't you try to either trade for offense because the offense is going to go up and you can help your offensive categories, and if you have one of these lower guys, you're good, or if you don't have one of the top aces that, that people draft in the first couple rounds, now would be the time to buy low on them because they may be more valuable later because a lot of those guys are not going to have the same stats toward the end of the season as the quote-unquote dependable aces, don't you think? I, I don't think it's a matter of of uh, the, star, the ace pitchers not pitching to their ability. Every year you have people who do and don't. I think it's a matter of valuation that they're not worth as much as we thought. They're not really – they shouldn't be worth first and second round spots. So the question is what what do you do with that knowledge that it's more fungible? I think that you downgrade. I think that you say, all right, let's do a two-for-two two trade, Take give your eighth pitcher away, get a top hitter, and trade and get a you know fifth-round pitcher and give up a fifth-round hitter. Right? I think that that's a way to, to do that. Nothing to do otherwise. I mean you're, you're not redrafting right now. Uh, but if you're going to trade, that would be the route. Uh, do you agree with that, Sarah? So I actually have traded uh, a bit from my pitching strength in Tout Wars for precisely this reason. I, I needed offense. I wanted more steals, and I wasn't getting them from the sources I had drafted originally. My my big sources of steals in my draft were supposed to be Whit Merrifield and Dylan, Dylan Carlson. Dylan Carlson, as y'all know, have, has struggled a lot. This season, his job is pretty much in jeopardy at the moment. I, I think he'll bounce back at some point. He's 23 years old, but it doesn't look like it might, it'll, it's going to happen at this moment in time. And so I needed a way to get somebody who was going to get on base more, who was going to be able to bring me in some more runs, who was going to be able to potentially have the opportunity to steal uh, what Merrifield isn't getting on base and stealing bags either. So that was that was kind of a problem for me. Um, the trades that I wound up pulling off in Tout Wars for both of – those situations and and keep in mind I did this because I was like nailing the ERA and whip categories and holds and saves to a point where I felt very 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 comfortable like I was fully when I made the first of these deals about 0.4 0.5 points ahead in ERA in this league so the the first deal I made was uh Julio Urias and Dylan Carlson for Bo Bichette before Bo Bichette heated up hoping that I can get that 2020 out of Bichette, and that obviously really upgrades me in that middle infielder spot. And then today, actually, um, in the tout table of all things, uh, Andy Barons and I were able to to come to terms on, you know, he's got a lot of hitting, I've got a lot of pitching. I traded him Kershaw, who I'm I'm worried about in terms of injury risk over the long season. It's been a while since he's really given us a ton of innings, even though he looks outstanding at the start of the season. I traded him Kershaw for Seiya Suzuki, who I think is another one of those players who can give you all of the categories, some power and some speed, and I'm hoping that that plays out well for me in the long term. In order to do that, I had to put my faith really in the fact that I think Corbin Burns is going to stay healthy and he's going to keep doing what he's doing. I think Logan Gilbert is going to stay healthy and hopefully um, improve a little bit. Some of the underlying numbers there don't look particularly great. I had to put faith in the fact that Tanner Houck is going to turn it around and look like right-handed Chris Sale again. Um, I've got a couple of other pitchers in that league who I feel pretty good about. Christian Javier, uh, Kyle Hendricks, of course, off a good start. And he really looks like he's made some adjustments on the ground ball rate and some other things that are going on that look more like traditional Kyle Hendricks rather than what he was earlier at the start of the season. So it it wasn't without risk, but I think that those types of moves could pay off for me over the long term. And if they don't, I will at least know that I tried and I did what I needed to do to put my offense in a place to succeed in a year where offense really feels like it's going to be hard to come by. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a decent trade for Kershaw. A word about Kershaw. Um, Be careful with using rest of season projections, looking at the innings left for Kershaw, because, um, you know, what the projection systems are going to do is they're just going to prorate time. Now, before the season started, he had a projection of, let's say, 145 innings or something like that. Uh, ATC actually had a 130-inning projection. Um, you can't just prorate that and say, well, we're a fifth away of the season, so to take off a fifth it doesn't really work that way with Kershaw. You almost have to subtract the innings. right? If he's, if he's, already, if he's already thrown uh, 30 innings, I think he's got 100 left. 
he doesn't have 120, uh, 130 left. Right? He's, uh, he, he, you can't just prorate it. I think you just have to subtract it because he, you know, they're going to sit him. Right? The idea is the Dodgers want to win the World Series. They're going to sit Kershaw. They're not going to let him pitch the whole time. Uh, and for that reason, that's is a good trade. Thing, is the same thing going to happen in. with Justin Verlander? I mean, they're um, not going to sit him. He, he's, he's, no, he's no, different. Like one or two years left. If he's pitching the way he is, you can you can extrapolate that he's going to be doing this the rest of the season. Different, no, nah, different than Kershaw. Kershaw is a different injury situation, I think. Um, last category, reliable closers. Do you think reliable closers are less valuable or more valuable this year, Sarah? Oh, I think they're substantially more valuable, and I pushed them up as high as I was comfortable in some of my drafts that were happening on the NFBC, uh, I play in the Earth League over there. I'm in Glarf, and I play in TGFBI over there. And then I have a couple of other teams as well. And I, I didn't push them high enough. I am, I am struggling in the reliever area in the NFBC. And one of the things I'd love both of your opinions on, because I listen to the show a lot and I take your advice frequently. You know, I'm almost at the point where. I have failed at chasing saves on the waiver wire. I'm looking at the fact that a lot of these jobs are just going to be fungible. Like the Red Sox closer situation may not be settled in August. Like we may never have a Red Sox closer, right? Like chasing Deekman or Robles on the on the waiver wire, wire feels a little bit like I'm just throwing bad, bad, mon- bad money away. And I wonder, like, at what point do you punt and just say, I'm not going to get the saves here. I'd rather get innings and strikeouts and wins and just try to win the other categories because I'm real close to that point. Ruben? Well, I I think it's still too early to punt because you're not in this you're not alone in this boat. A lot of teams don't have that many saves. Even Edwin Diaz didn't have that many saves until a couple weeks ago when the Mets started actually having close games. So you know I I, I wouldn't start punting just yet. I I, th- I think that it's still salvageable because there will be players available later on the season for closers. The stable closers have not lost their jobs yet. The stable ones, the only way they can lose their job at this point is due to injury. And so far except for, I guess, Ryan Presley, they've actually been relatively healthy, so they've been pretty good. They've been very stable, which means their value is very high. But that also means that there's going to be a lot of turnover in the, in the lower teams. I mean, how many people bit, put money into to many different Reds closers, and the Reds don't even have any games to save? I mean, it, you have to know who you're putting your money into when you're doing the waiver wire. Are you going to put in for a Reds closer? I don't think so. Are you going to put in for a, Nats, a, Nats, a Nationals possible closer, a Pirates possible closer if Bednar gets traded? I, you don't know because... It, it's it's just it, I, I think you shouldn't punt. I think you could still make up some points unless you think that it's completely lost and you're not going to gain any points. And then you can just punt this punt that category and just go for middle relievers and work the work your ERA and whip and do it that way. So I'm going to take the opposite approach. Um, well, just for argument's sake, but listen to this one. Um, you're right, Sarah, in that the ace closers are worth more, but it's worth more because. Of two things, because one, A, the reliable closers are actually well correlated with the people who were reliable in drafts. So, you know, you're taking the, the, the top closers in baseball, Edwin Diaz and Josh Hader and Rice Iglesias, all the guys who we thought were top guys pretty much are aligned with the top guys on an actual value basis now. You got Daniel Bard, who's just saving games. All right, you got a guy jumping up there. You're going to get that all, you know, all the time. But in general, you know, it correlates well, and the bottom, all those darts at the bottom really have been missing in general. So you're right. Um, but the, if you look at the actual value of relievers in general, they're down. So the reason that closers are worth more is a market premium. You had to pay some draft capital just to get saves. But in a real value, in terms of how much does, the, does their actual combined value of strikeouts plus SWIP plus this hurt, it's less. It's less compared to usual. For that reason, I would think that the time to punt saves is earlier rather than later. I think that if you see yourself in a position that there's not going to be many points to gain on the saves and everybody else is running away with it, they're going to run away more with it and it's going to be harder for you to gain on anybody even mid-season. Once you get really lucky and somehow stumble on to the next guy who's you know going to lead saves in the second half. I kind of think that you're better off going for value. Guys like Michael King. Guys like, uh, well, Whitlock and Strider are, are starting games now, but uh, r- rally on the, uh, on the Tampa Bay Rays. 
we're talking about value. I would rather pick the middle relievers with value to help your ERA and whip. I think for your team, you might be in a position where those middle relievers are more valuable than chasing saves. And saves on the waiver wire, they're a really bad return on investment. I mean, you're going to have to pay a lot. And who the hell knows? Aruven and I picked up Jake McGee for like 90 <laughs> bucks or so. Uh, I hope it was 90 bucks uh, in the NFBC, and now he's hurt. I mean, it was just a terrible return on investment that we did it. But we're struggling for saves, so we said, all right, what the hell? Throw some money at it. I don't know if that's the right decision. I kind of think that it's not. Um, or at least the, the point of punting is earlier this year than it usually is, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And one of the guys that I'm keeping an eye on who maybe isn't at the top of the list for people who don't watch a lot of NL Central baseball, Keegan Thompson, in my mind, is very similar to what the Red Sox have been doing with Garrett Whitlock. It's He doesn't strike out as many guys, so I don't want people to think that they're going to get quite as many strikeouts as you would get with Garrett Whitlock. You are not. But he is a guy who's going to get a spot start. He got a spot start. Uh, earlier this week in San Diego, he's going to throw three or four innings every time he comes out. And a lot of times that is going to result in him getting a win. He's going to give you decent numbers. He's not going to walk a ton of guys and his ERA is going to stay low. And so Keegan Thompson is a guy that I've added in a bunch of my 15 teamers on the NFBC in places where I'm struggling with saves, where I'm thinking I need more volume to sort of get over this this hump where I, I just don't, I spent about you know, a month trying to throw 20, 30% of my fab at every possible new closer opportunity that was out there. And all of them resulted in maybe one save here or there. It just didn't seem like it was a smart investment. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's always situation dependent upon which team, you know, oh, you know, if if there's four teams that have like one save, oh, sure, it's probably worth it to, 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 to try and, you know, pick somebody off the waiver wire. But the general answer, I think, is to punt earlier. So um, we were going to do a couple of buy low, sell low, buy high, sell high guys. Uh, we sort of you know, went over in a great discussion here in strategy. So let's just do a couple of these really fast in terms of are we buying, are we selling, are you holding, that kind of thing. Uh, you mentioned Seiya Suzuki, who you traded for Kershaw. I'm assuming that you're a buy Right right now, Sarah, right? Absolutely. I think Seiya Suzuki is awesome. I know he's struggled a little bit in the last few weeks. Uh, if you're watching him, it looks like every time he's at the plate, he's just gathering information that he is going to unleash on people later. <laughs> it really looks like he's just trying to learn as much about the league as humanly possible. And as soon as he can do damage, he has and will. Um, I love his approach. I love the way that he extends at bats. I love how he hits the ball to all fields. I love the way that he finds spots to make him to make his at bats matter. And I think that he's going to play a ton on this Cubs team. So Seiya Suzuki is definitely a buy for me. You agree, Ruve? I do agree, and I have some actual numbers to, besides what besides what you can the eye test to back it up. His bat is a little high. It's like three thirty nine. It's a little bit high, but he has a high walk rate. He his stack cast, his hard hit rate is close to 40, which is amazing. And if he can continue that, his Babbitt will remain high and his batting average will be high. And as soon as you get summertime in, in Wrigley Field, a lot of those balls, even if the, it's a new ball, they'll start going out more. And I think he's a definitely buy guy at this point. The only problem is he's got a 28% K rate, which I'm a little bit concerned about. But because his walk rate is high, I, I don't think that's an issue. I think he's just pressing a little bit when that's why he's striking out so much. And 14% walk rate, which I, I like. Uh, funny, the two things that draw me to him are the walk rate and the fact that he might actually steal some bases. I don't know if we'll get to 10, but you know, even if he gets seven, eight stolen bases this year, I think that's decent. All right. You know, one. Ariel, yes. sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah. it is worth noting you were talking about teams that run earlier, and the Cubs have not maybe run as much as people thought they would, but they have been thrown out on the base pass a lot. They have like 21 toot lands this season, according to our unofficial Cubs fam family trackers over on Twitter. Uh, that is because they have decided to have an aggressive stance on the base paths this year. So I think that they are a team that will run and they'll run better as the season goes on. At the moment, they're getting a little bit outmatched and they're not running in the smartest situations. But I do think that's a team that will run as the season goes on. Excellent point. And that plays into his uh, value. Uh, quickly, Marcus Stroman. Uh, is this a buy, high, buy, uh, sorry, buy, sell, hold? For me, he's a sell. Um, I, I never really liked Marcus Stroman in fantasy. Um, he left the Mets and gave us a grin. So I don't even want my fantasy team, Mr. Marcus. Sorry. Uh, uh, what are we doing with him? 
I'm out on Marcus Stroman. I like him a lot as a Cubs fan. I like him as a pitcher for my favorite team. I think that his last couple of starts have been great, but I don't have him on any of my fantasy teams. When you look at his stat cast page, none of it looks particularly great. Uh, it's a lot of blue, not a lot of red. And I, I also just think that he's kind of, he looks like he's tinkering a little bit at the moment, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not really what you want to see from a pitcher that you're about to invest in. So Whenever I see a pitcher who is kind of like has a bad start, has a mediocre start, goes back to a mediocre start, then has an okay start, I wonder about what's going on under the hood. And in Stroman's case, it seems like he's trying to figure some stuff out. I'm not saying that he's not going to be great later in the season. He might be an awesome buy in August. But at this moment in time, I'm out on Stroman. 7% swinging strike rate. That's pretty bad. And I, sorry, but the Cubs are not a really fantastic team. Sorry, uh, Sarah, but no, uh, I, I'm well aware. <laughs> yeah, wins <laughs> wins might be limited for Stroman. So uh, bad fantasy asset. Do uh, you agree, Ruben? I'm actually going to take the opposite opinion oh. here. I'm going to say a buy low here because his whip is 1.18. His ERA is over five. His strand rate right now is 55, percent which is ridiculously low that's gonna go back up and once that goes back up his ERA will cool will come back to earth um the only thing I'm really concerned about is that his fly ball rate is up and he's a ground ball pitcher so if he's tinkering something that's great but if his fly ball rate is up and he's in Chicago and not in the comfy confines of City Field that's a little bit nerve-wracking to pitch him there but if he pitches outside of Wrigley he may be a guy you may want to have on a matchup basis what about Joey Votto what are your thoughts on him uh, Joey Votto, he's 39. Um, he's got a great TikTok account. I'll give him that. But he's got zero home runs. His K rate is up 10%. His hard hit rate is only 20%, which is down from his career of 37.9. Do you know what Robin Cano's um, hard hit rate for this year is? 30%. And he was released. So I'm, I, I don't want anything to do with Joey Votto, and I don't have any shares of him. Uh, Sarah, what do you think? No, you you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I think that Joey Votto's story last year where he sort of changed his approach at the plate and dropped a couple of points in OBP so that he could expand his power horizon and give us more home runs was a great story. I had him in that like tier of first baseman I really wanted for that particular reason, but he hasn't really shown any of that. This season, if you look at his hit chart on Baseball Savant right now, it, it it's not great. Like, he he really hasn't shown a lot of power at all. This Reds team is not inspiring. And he's going to play a lot, but I just think that the magic may have run out for Joey Votto as much as I love him and I love his TikTok account. Um, I value his TikTok account very – no. I, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, no. Joey Votto, uh, he's, his strikeout rate this year is 32%. Anybody want to guess what his career strikeout rate is? I would guess right around 10. Yeah. A little bit higher than 10. Uh, Nick, I mean, Nick Madrigal is, is like that territory. But uh, no, 18%, which is which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, he's striking out more. Now, he's not this bad. You will get a bounce back in terms of value for him. But um, I, can't, I can't see it. I can't see it. I know it's Joey Votto. He's a future Hall of Famer, in my opinion. And, Hall, you know, Hall of Famers do, uh, as uh, Rob Silver would say, Hall of Famers do Hall of Famer things. And he's the second half guy, Votto. But ah, uh, I think even uh, even Derek Cardi, who's a Votto lover, is uh, losing patience with him. So I'm and he's on, on. and he's in a very bad lineup. Also, that team is not that good to begin with. He, he's he's he was he has no protection there. He has zero protection right now. They, I mean, they have a bunch of quadruple A players there, just like um, Aristus Aquino, who's a quadru great quadruple A player, just like Joe Adele, who's a great quadruple A player, and just like Jared Kelenic. As a good quadruple A player, I don't know if I can allow to say that on this podcast or not. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's also a matter of the lineup they're in. I mean, do you would you buy low on any of the Detroit Tigers right now? I mean, Akil Badu, people got him for stolen bases, but if he can't get on base, he has no value. Yeah, uh, the Reds are on pace to win thirty six games this year. So, Ugh. next player, Brian Reynolds. Um, this guy is so variable. He's got a Amazing year, terrible year, amazing year, terrible year. Um, it, it's hard to give up on him. I, I don't think he's a buy for me. I don't think he's a sell. I think he's a hold. I think if you have him, you're going to keep him, but I'm not looking to acquire him. Pittsburgh's not a great team. Will he stay in Pittsburgh? Who the hell knows? Uh, and I'm sorry, did, uh, did, I think he signed, uh, did he, he signed, right? 
He did sign an extension. Okay, like, sorry. A four year extension. So he's he's stuck in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's not going anywhere, um, which is probably bad for him. So I think I'm going to hold with him. Not not much to do. You guys agree? I actually like this Pirates team more than I care to admit. And as an NL Central fan of another team, it, it sort of pains me because I've thought of the Pirates for the last few years as a team that the Cubs could just do some damage on. And, and admittedly, they scored 21 runs against them earlier this season. And that was a phenomenal day. But that was also the only win that the Cubs got in a four game series. Uh, and in a series where they outscored the Pirates by like 20 runs and they just got them all in the wrong game. I think Brian Reynolds is a sneaky good player, and I think he's one of the players right now who is being impacted a little bit by lower batting average, by lower slugging because of the baseball. I think that those numbers are going to improve as the season goes on. And I like what the Pirates are putting in around them. I like that they called up Diego Castillo. I think that they're going to call up O'Neill Cruz at some point this season. The difference between the Pirates and the Reds and the Cubs for me right now is that the Pirates are going to call up their fun young players in order to try to see what this team can do. And as a result, I think they're going to wind up in third in this division while the Cubs and the Reds kind of twiddle their thumbs and don't let anything happen. So Brian Reynolds is definitely a hold for me. I might be inclined to buy him if the price was right. Uh, he's an interesting guy who I would like to have on my fantasy team. Move it. Yes, he's going to be sneaky good the second half of the year, especially when the Pirates finally bring up O'Neill Cruz, who's actually crushing it in, in AAA right now, because he there are pieces there. You have Cabrian Hayes, you have him, and you have um, O'Neill Cruz, who's going to come up. They also have a top-rated catcher who's going to be up in two years. That lineup is going to get good. Right now, it's not that great, but as soon as it gets good he'll have people around him and he's been unlucky his babbitt's been 278 right now so he's just been unlucky i think he's going to turn around i think this is a guy if you can try to trade for and buy low on i think this is a perfect opportunity because you don't have to pay that much for him because right now he, his stats don't show who he really is yeah and reynolds actually ha usually will hit about a 320 babbitt uh so it's especially low for him uh david bednar our next guy uh he's had a phenomenal start to the year 42 percent k rate 115 ERA, 0.7 whip. He's actually saving a lot of games lately. You know, we didn't know the season. Is it Stratton? Is it him? They said they'll share. It's it's him. He's the closer. Is this a buy for David Bednar? The only reason I say maybe, otherwise he's for sure a buy, is that A, it's the Pirates, but I think the Pirates are going to play close games and they're going to win some games. Some of the division is weak, so I think it's actually a good situation for him. Problem is, will he be traded? If he's traded mid-year, is he going to be the closer wherever he goes? If not, he loses almost all his value, or at least a large part of his value with the saves that you're probably using him for now. So are you buying David Bednar, Sarah? I would buy David Bednar right now, but I would buy him with the idea that I am only going to have him until late July. That at some point in time, he is going to get traded and I'm going to lose all of his value. Um, now... The, the leagues where I would buy David Bednar are leagues where I have like very few saves or where I'm close enough in saves that I can see in the leaderboard a way for myself to make a move by just adding like those 10 to 12 saves that he might get me before he gets traded to somebody else. I think David Bednar is definitely going to be traded. I think if you buy him, you need to buy him knowing that. And I think that you may want to buy him with a contingency plan to sell him accordingly, hopefully to somebody who's not paying as close of attention to the context around what is going to happen with Bednar. But he looks great. I think that he is a, he's an outstanding closer for the Pirates, and the Pirates are going to win more games than people think they are. The bottom of that NL Central division allows for a lot of close games, and Bednar is going to close a lot of them against the Reds, against the Cardinals, against the Cubs, until he gets traded. All right, so I'll ask you this, Ruvain. So assuming he's going to be the closer until the trading deadline, What's the probability that he's still a closer after the trading deadline? Either A, he doesn't get traded, right, and then he gets all the shares, or B, he gets traded, but to a team that's looking for him to be the closer or gets traded for a team and the, their closer gets injured or something. What's the probability that he remains closer after the trading deadline? Almost zero, in my opinion. Because really? If he, yes, I, I don't think he's going to be closer. But because his, his stats are so good, he has value elsewhere. His his ERA is 1.15. His whip is very good. He strikes out, what is it? He strikes out 13.79K 13, 13 per nine. I mean, he still has value. It's, it's not like you're going to lose value completely. But 
I think he's going to be traded to either one of the LA teams or one of the New York teams just to bolster their bullpen. I don't think he's going to be a, a good guy who's going to be who's going to get the job. Look what happened to Rich Rodriguez last year. Rich Rodriguez was their closer when he got traded. He's he wasn't considered a top guy to close somewhere. He was. The- the seventh inning guy, the eighth inning guy, I think Bednar is going to be the same type of trade later in the year. But if he goes to one of these better teams and he's a seventh inning and eighth inning guy, he'll be sneaky to get a lot of wins out of, though, because he's going to be in a position he's going to be on a better team and he got a chance for that. I'm actually going to say that it's over 50% that he's still the closer for the rest of the year. The reason is I think there's a very high chance he stays. I mean, they signed Brian Reynolds instead of giving him up last year at the top of his value. They're looking to save base guys that are cheap. He's cheap right now, uh, Bednar, and he's very, very, very valuable. Um, I kind of think that there's a good chance they keep him, and you never know. They could trade him to a team, um, I don't know, let's say they trade him to Minnesota. He might be the closer there. Uh, Let's say they trade him to Toronto and Romano's hurt or whatever. I can see so many situations that he's still the closer, that I think he's a buy right now, and I think that you're going to get more saves out of him rest of the year than you really think, uh, and that makes him very, very valuable. Plus, as a middle reliever even, he's just phenomenal. Um, so I, I kind of really like buying David Bednar here. NL Central predictions. Um, Sarah, what do you think the uh, way that uh, – this is our NL Central episode, by the way. Uh, all the all the bylaws and stuff, they were all NL Central. I didn't say that before the segment, but uh, that's what we did. Sarah's an NL Central gal. Um, what are your predictions for how their teams are going to finish this year? I think that the Brewers are the class of the NL Central, and I really don't think it's particularly close. I've been super intrigued by what the Cardinals are doing because I think that the Cardinals could give the Brewers – a run for their money, but in order to do it, they are going to have to call up some of their really impactful young talent. And I I think it's interesting that they sent Paul DeYoung to the minors and they didn't call up Nolan Gorman, who seemed like the obvious guy for them to call up to make a huge impact for this team as they're trying to chase down the Brewers. That just, that all of that feels a little bit off to me. I do think that the, Brewers and the Cardinals are the two teams in this division to make an impact. They're the teams that are going to act like they're trying to win. They're the teams that are going to call guys up. They're gonna, they're the teams that are going to do their whole thing. I think that the Pirates are interesting from a wa- waiver wire perspective in the sense that they will let some of their young talent play this season. I think you will see O'Neill Cruz this year. I think you will see them call up some of their other young talent. I think that we already have Diego Castillo playing on a pretty much daily basis. They want to see what they have there. They signed Brian Hayes to an extension. They signed Brian Reynolds to an extension. The Pirates are sort of preparing their next window. But beyond that, the Cubs aren't going to call up anybody. I, there are a lot of Cubs prospects I am interested in, and I don't think any of them are going to see a single inning of playing time at Wrigley Field this season, as much as it pains me and as much as I would love to see some of them come up at some point this season. I don't think the Reds are going to do that either. So I think that you really need to look at the teams in this division as sort of a stratified. You have the teams that are going to try to win the division and actually try to make it to the playoffs. That is the Brewers and the Cardinals. You have the Pirates who are interested in seeing what they've got, and they are going to call up some guys, and you can look at their minor leaguers and think that they are interesting to talk about. And then and then you have the rest of the division, and they're not going to do very much this year except sell tickets and try to sell beer. I've got the Brewers, Cardinals, then I'll actually have the Cubs, Pirates, and Reds. <laughs> I funny. appreciate your faith. <laughs> it's funny because last year when we did the show and we asked you, you had the Cubs higher, and I'm like, nah, they're going to trade every, away every last person on the team, and uh, unfortunately they did. Yeah, um, that was a painful day. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, hopefully they hopefully they improve from all those trades because that was a lot of players to uh, to trade from the same team. Really, wow. Ruben? I think that it's a two-team race. I think both the Brewers and the Cardinals will make the playoffs because they get to play the Pirates and the Cubs and the Reds so many times. So they're going to get a lot of wins, and I think just for that reason alone, they're both going to make the playoffs. And I think it's the Brewers' division to win if uh, Brandon Woodruff can figure out what is going on. If he can fix it, then the Brewers run away with it. Otherwise, if they stay close to the Cardinals, look what the Cardinals did last year. They just they strung they strung together twenty some odd wins in a row. 
the Cardinals are very sneaky good. So you have to be careful if you keep if you let them hang around, they may just come and pass the Brewers. But I think it's going to be the Brewers first. I think I think Brent Woodruff will figure it out. I think the Cardinals will finish in second. I also think the Cubs will finish in third because I think that the Pirates are still going to trade away some of their key parts toward the trade deadline, and the Reds are just going to be the Reds. Sarah, how many wildcard teams will be from the NL Central? Will it be zero? I'm not super optimistic that there's going to be a wild card team from the NL Central, although I do think that if there is one, it will be the Cardinals, and it will be for exactly the reason Ruvain just said, which is that they get a lot of games against lower-level competition that is going to allow them to pad their win-loss um, numbers over the course of the season. I think that the NL East and the NL West are both pretty brutal divisions right now. Everybody seems better than you thought they were, and they're really trying to play and win. And so I, I, I think it's possible for the Cardinals to sneak in there, but I really think that I, I'm going to stick with what I said at the start of the season, which is that I don't think a wild card comes out of the NL Central. If it does, it's the Cardinals. The, the NL West, every single team is over 500, and in the NL East, only the Mets are over 500. So you're saying it's brutal, but it's just, it seems, I, I, something doesn't seem right here. I, I, things are going to change. I, I think that the Central, the NL Central will get more wins, which is why I think, I don't think the, I don't think the, the Colorado Rockies are, are for real. I don't think the Colorado Rockies are an above 500 team. So if they're not above 500, they're one game over right now, which means that they're going to have to fall. And in order to fall, they have to lose games to other teams, obviously. And it's not just going to be the Dodgers and the Giants getting all those wins. I think the NL Central will be sneaky getting some wins, especially in Colorado later on. And we'll, you know, we'll see how things go with the NL East, if the Braves can turn around since Acuna is back. Do you remember, Ruvain, what my bold prediction was for playoffs? It was that the Rockies make the playoffs. So, uh, <laughs> hey, that's still looking strong. Um, I, I, your point is good that, you know, NL Central is worse at the bottom, so there's going to be more wins. But, you know, just take a look. The, the, the Mets, I, I'm optimistic about the Mets making the playoffs, but I, don't know, I still somehow, as the pessimistic Met fan, think the Braves are going to catch them. So you got at least one NL team, NL East team. The Giants and Dodgers are going to make the playoffs, and – the Padres are going to be close. They have to be. So where is where is that other, you know, you'd have to have the Cardinals beat out the Padres. It's going to be close. I, I'm going to probably say there's none from the Central, but it wouldn't surprise me but, uh, because of your reason, Ruvain. And the Padres pitching failed last year. So if that happens again, if the injury bug hits them, then they'll fall over like they did last year, even with Tatis coming back. All right, let's do some waiver wire picks. Uh, name a player that you think uh, we should be looking at to pick up on the wire this week, Sarah. This week, uh, the player, well, I, I guess it depends on your league because I'm in a few leagues where George Kirby wasn't available last week. And so in those leagues where George Kirby wasn't available last week, that is clearly the guy that I am targeting this week. And I and that's really if you're in one of those NFBC teams uh, that didn't have him available because he wasn't drafted originally. And so he has to come up this next week. Um, in terms of other guys that I might be looking at in maybe a 12 team league, a 10 team league who haven't been picked up yet. I picked up Brandon Drury in a couple of different 15 team leagues last week. And I, I honestly think this dude looks legit and I'm going to be looking at him in my 12 teamers. I think that Brandon Drury's stat cast numbers are really impressive. He gives you multi-position eligibility. He's playing on a Reds team that is totally decimated right now. His playing time is not in jeopardy whatsoever. Say what you will about the Reds. Great American Ballpark is still a great place to hit. And whenever you can get a guy who is super hot hitting in Great American Ballpark who has playing time guaranteed, I am interested in him. And Brandon Drury is that guy. All righty. Moving. One comment about Brandon Drury. He has more plate appearances this year than and he had all of last year. So just keep that in mind. He hasn't he hasn't had over 400 at bats since 2019. So whether he can, can keep it going, if he can, great for him. But, but I mean, it's 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 a stretch because he hasn't done it. He hasn't done it before. So you're 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 if, if you're 100 percent right, you get a guy in Great American Ballpark and he gets hot. Same thing with Jolie Votto. If if, Joel, if you have Jolie Votto, he could get hot and he's playing Great American Ballpark. So there's a possibility there. Now I'm going to mention two people. Um, I have a catcher, and I think Ariel, you mentioned him a couple weeks ago, and it's Jonah Heim. He's the catcher now in Texas. Uh, Mitch Gar 
Carver is on the aisle with an elbow injury. There's no timetable for his return. If you're streaming catchers or if he's available in any in your league right now, he's 45% owned in CBS, so he may not be available. But so far in 45 at-bats, he's batting 356 with three homers and 10 RBIs. Knowing that, if you're streaming catchers, he's a catcher you can perfect you can stream perfectly well. And we're talking about middle relievers before. I'm going to mention Rafael Montero, the former Met, has racked up three saves already with the Astros in the last two weeks because Ryan Presley is still coming back from an injury. And even if he doesn't close, his ERA for the season, 0.73. His whip, 0.89. 17 strikeouts in 12 innings. And his velocity is at a career high of 96, which is up from 94 and 95 from the prior year. So if you want a middle relief guy, he's available in most leagues and he's a guy you can get. Wow, well, Ruvain, we were talking before the episode that, that uh, on the last show, you and I had no players alike. <laughs> but you actually stole my Rafael Montero pick. And maybe that's because we own Ra- Ryan Presley together in a couple leagues, and maybe we should back him up. Uh, but, think, yeah, yeah, I like I Montero. So. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Drury was also my, on my list, Sarah, so you stole that one. Um, I do want to mention uh, Juan Yepes, who's looking really great. Uh, if he's available in your shallow league, I would consider him also. James Caprillion, 25% owned on CBS. That's a dart. He just came back. He had a bad first outing where he had two innings pitched, four runs or so. So he's if you're looking at your waiver wire and you're looking at the numbers, if you sort by you know ERA or value or whatever, he's going to look bad. And he might look bad to owners to pick up, so you might still have a chance to get him. But he seemed like a good dart to pick in deeper leagues. Uh, Tyler Wells. Off to a really good start. A lot of a couple good starts in a row. He's got a tough schedule coming up, but if you do have room for him, he's interesting. Baltimore Park is much better this year than usual. He's interesting. Um, question: You know, you mentioned Mitch Garver's on the IL. What do you do with the NFBC if you have Mitch Garver on your team? You're going to want to pick up another catcher. Is he somebody? Assuming you, you know, if you have a lot of room on your on your bench, sure you keep him, but. Assuming you don't have a lot of room, is he a drop for you, Ruben? Yes, 100%. 100%. It's an elbow injury. It's a catcher. He needs his elbow to throw, he can, and they're not going to keep him as a okay. DH. So until he figure out what's going on with him, it may be a Travis Darno situation where he may end up needing, needing Tommy John. We don't know the situation yet. All we know is that he's on the IL, and we don't know how long it's going to be. And if you can pick up Jonah Hahn to replace him, that's perfect. But if you can't, I, I don't think you should waste a roster spot for an injured catcher in a two-catcher league. All right, now it's time for the pitcher preview. It's the section where we look at pitchers who face the Pirates. All right, Sarah, who's the pitcher you want to pick up this week? So the guy that I am most interested in is Tyler Anderson. I just watched him pitch against the Cubs. He has two starts coming up. He's throwing against, uh, well, he's scheduled to start against Arizona. He's also scheduled to start against the Phillies. I admit that throwing against the Phillies isn't exactly fun, but I will say Tyler Anderson looks legit and the Dodgers do this thing where they just kind of magically get pitchers into this awesome zone and Tyler Anderson's numbers bear that out. He currently is has a 2.78 ERA. That's not totally out of line with his FIP, which is at 2.55. I think that Tyler Anderson is a guy and I think I trust David Roberts to manage that game in a way that will keep Tyler Anderson in the game as much as humanly possible. The other guy who I already mentioned, uh, who also has two starts potentially coming up this week if Tyler Anderson is not available, is Keegan Thompson, who, look, the Cubs are going to need starters, and Keegan Thompson is going to have two starts, one against uh, the Pirates and one against the Arizona Diamondbacks. And Keegan Thompson has been very, very good this year for the Chicago Cubs. He didn't give up an earned run for the first, like, 20 innings he threw this season. He's not a strikeout artist. You're not going to boost your strikeout numbers here, and he's not going to pitch a ton of innings. But Keegan Thompson, two-start week, could do you some real good in this uh, next period. And and by the way, Anderson, it's possible that he might actually not pitch against Philly. He might actually – yeah, he might actually pitch the following week. If he did, it would be a two-start week against Washington and Arizona. Those are Which makes him even better. (laughs) Which makes him even better. Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) Ruby? I'm not going to mention a two-star pitcher here, but I am going to mention a pitcher that I think should be picked up and should be owned universally at this point if he's still available, and that's Max Mayer from the Miami Marlins. He's 48% on CBS leagues. Eliezer Hernandez has one foot out the rotation door at this point, and if you look at what Mayer or Meyer, however you pronounce his last name, he's doing a triple-A, 31 innings, 
39 strikeouts. It's 11.2 K per nine, an ERA of 1.72 and a whip of eight of 0.86. He will be called up soon. If he's available, he's a guy who can make an impact on your roster as soon as he's called up. I like that. Marlins are an organization to promote pitchers earlier than others, so it's an excellent pick. Uh, I'll throw out Spencer Strider. Looks like he's starting now. This is like a Garrett Whitlock guy. Um, he's pitching at Milwaukee this week, which even though we said Milwaukee's a good team, they're not a good hitting team. Uh, they're just a good team overall, mostly because of their pitching. Uh, and then he would be two-star against Philly and Miami. So that's interesting, Spencer Strider. And my next guy, I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are because he's pitching against the Pirates this week, Drew Smiley. If next week he would actually be two starts against uh, Cincinnati and the White Sox, what's your thoughts on Drew Smiley? Is that a good pick for this week, Sarah? I actually love what Drew Smiley has done as the number five starter or ostensibly the number five starter for the Chicago Cubs this season. He's got a 3.04 ERA. It's admittedly he's overperforming his FIP a little like by quite a lot. His FIP is currently 5.07, but he has done everything that you would want a number five starter to do. Every time that he has taken the mound, he gives up three or four runs. He gets his strikeouts. He gets his innings. He does his job. The problem is that the Cubs have not been particularly reliable and Drew Drew Smiley starts at getting him the offense he needs to get a win. So if you're looking for wins or if you're looking for like seven or eight innings, I don't think Drew Smiley is your guy. But if you're looking for what you would expect out of a number five starter, four to six innings, it's going to give you some quality numbers. He's not going to blow up your ratios. I think Drew Smiley is a guy that you can trust. Low K rate, though. That's my only thing. But he's facing the Pirates. Um, and I just have to look at who's facing the Pirates. It's usually a good start. Uh, one mailbag question here is interesting. Follow-up from last week. So uh, Badger Maniac asks, he says, Hey, Ariel, in your frustration episode, I think you missed the big one. How about the situation where you have pitchers with good underlying metrics but no results? My worst XFIP is about 365, but my team ERA is 4-3. It's just simply nothing to act on. Even with regression, the month plus of horror numbers will do lo- long lasting damage. And I'm referring to the frustration episode, Sarah, that last week we were talking about what is the worst frustrating thing in, as a fantasy baseball player? Is it injuries? Is it bad play? Is it overbidding on the waiver wire, underbidding? How does this one rank for you in terms of the guys are just, you know, ERA is bad, but the FIP and the Sierra are great. So they should be better. And you have to hold because they will be better. Is this, how does this rank as frustrating to you? That is not frustrating for me. That makes me feel like I have got a little bit of gold in my back pocket that I am going to trade in at some point in the future. I, there are only so many things that players can control, right? So I tend not to look at, say, RBIs as, as, as a stat on which I keep or drop a player. It's not their fault, whoever was on base or who was in scoring position, when they got a hit. But I am interested in hard contact. I am interested in how often they're striking out. I am interested in their whip rate and what they're seeing at the plate and what they're swinging at. Similarly for pitchers, I'm interested in how often they're throwing the ball in the zone, how often they're getting called or swinging strikes, how often they are taking the mound and doing the things that they need to do in order to succeed. And one of the reasons, you know, I mentioned Kyle Hendricks earlier. One of the reasons that I am so interested in Kyle Hendricks right now, he had a not great start against the White Sox, but he came out of that start saying, you know, my mechanics felt much better. I was doing the things I wanted to do. I got more ground balls. There was a lot of bad, batted ball luck, and I was just trying to do my thing. I went back and looked at that. Kyle Hendricks is absolutely right about that. And then he comes out the next start and he throws eight and two thirds scoreless against the Padres. I think it is important to look at the underlying numbers and to see what the player can actually control. And so if I had a player like that, I wouldn't be frustrated with them. I'd just be holding on and waiting for the turn to where they get what they actually deserve. What a great answer. Uh, love it. Ruvain, you agree? I 100% agree. And just look at Luis Castillo last year. First part of the season, he was not that good. And then all of a sudden, he turned it around. And he looked like the picture he was before. So there's nothing really I can add to that. That was a perfect answer, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, y'all are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Injury update time. Go for it, Ruben. 
All right, we got a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to try to condense it. I mentioned Jake McGee. He was placed on the IL with lower back pain or lower back tightness. This may be a reason why he was ineffective recently. Camilo Duval is almost entrenched there now as a closer, but with the, with the Giants, you never know who's going to close. Um, Jonathan India, he's on the IL with a hamstring issue. He's not going to start a rehab assignment until maybe the end of next week, so he's still a little ways away. Um, I mentioned about Mitch Garver. He's got a flexor sprain, and they don't know how bad it is, so I think he could be a drop. Um, I mentioned Jonah Heim as a possible pickup. Sam Huff is the backup there also, so if you're interested with that. Chris Paddock was placed on the IL with an elbow injury. He is seeking a second opinion and could require surgery. Not good. If you have him, it's tough to hold on to him at this point. If he's considering surgery, he had an issue with his elbow last year. You may want to consider dropping him earlier as opposed to later because you may get more bang for your buck now for someone else because I don't know how many more innings he's going to pitch. Jarrell Cotton was called up. I think, Sarah, I think you remember him. Mitch Hanniger, <laughs> he's set to miss 10 to 12 weeks with a grade two right ankle sprain. So he's going to be out for a long time. A guy who you have to watch out for, Kyle Lewis. He's going to be activated hopefully within the next week or two for the Mariners. So he may get a lot of playing time if he's available. Try to jump on that. Edward Oliveris was placed on the aisle with a strained white right quad. We don't know how bad it is, but the Royals already said that he's going to miss at least six weeks. So if you have him, you could probably drop him at this point. Lucas Sims, he was placed again on the aisle with this time with low back pain. You want to guess the closer? Good, good, you know, guess who you want to. I mean, they have Art Warren, Tony Santillan, and Hunter Strickland there. Art Warren came into a game today when they're up by four, so take that for whatever it's worth. And I'm also going to mention Jack Flaherty. Jack Flaherty has been in the aisle with a shoulder injury. He was supposed to have two bullpen sessions this week. He did, and he's, he's doing a, f- a throwing program at this point. He's still going to need some sim games. He's going to need a minor league rehab. He's still trending to return early to mid-June. So if you're holding on to them, hold on just a little bit longer and hope there are no setbacks. A lot of good updates there. Uh, Nice job, Ruvain. All right, well, that is the end of our show. I want to thank Sarah Sanchez for coming on the show. Sarah, why don't you just tell everybody where we can uh, find you, read your stuff, and all things Sarah Sanchez. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, You can find my writing at bleedcubbyblue.com. I cover mostly Cub stuff, have a piece I'm working on right now about Nick Madrigal and what's going on with him. Um, But also all things, all things Cubs and a little bit more about baseball stuff. And then please follow me on Twitter at BCB underscore Sarah, no H on the Sarah. And my podcast is at at Cup of Cubby Blue. Awesome. Move it. You can follow me on Twitter at MLB Injury Guru, where I tweet out injury updates as they come. I also have a weekly article for Rotoballer discussing the injuries I talked about tonight, as well as all the other injuries that are, inter- that are fantasy relevant and who's up next, who's going to replace the injured players. And I'm Ariel Cohen. You can find me on Twitter at ATCNY. You can read my stuff over at Fangraphs, over at Rotoballer, and uh, you can listen to me right here on the Beat the Shift podcast. Every week, and hopefully next week I won't have a hoarse voice. Uh, If you've made it this far, uh, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate you uh, dealing with my voice here, and hopefully the information was well worth it to hear a little bit of a raspy Ariel Cohen on on the show today. Uh, Once again, thanks so much to Sarah Sanchez for joining the show, and from all of us here at Beat the Shift, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Shift podcast presented by Fangress. Follow us on Twitter at beat underscore shift underscore pod.